I realized uh, that I forgot to go over the wrap-up question for yesterday. So, um, let's quickly do that. So, uh, how would a main sequence B stars, mass, radius, temperature, color, lifespan, and rarity compare to the sun? So, the sun is a G2 uh, main sequence star. It's right here. And so, B stars are over here. So, how do they uh, relate to the sun in this manner? Well, let's see. What are all the terms? So, uh, mass and radius. I mean, you can kind of just see by the by the by the stars here, they are bigger, so those are going to be bigger. And also, again, notice the the one solar radius line that goes right here through the sun. Uh, the B stars are all above that to some degree. So yeah, um, so the a main sequence used to be larger, more massive. Uh, the temperature is hotter, right? Because they're over here, so uh, hotter. They're bluer. You can see it from the color. Uh, the lifespan, they are, uh, I guess, shorter lifespan uh, and more rare. Okay, so that's sort of how that all lines compare to the sun. So any main sequence blue star compared to the sun would be larger, more massive, hotter, bluer, live less, and uh, would be more rare. So that's kind of how that goes there. Okay, so moving on now to the warm-up question for today. So today we're going to get into, okay, so here's how you classify. Yesterday we talked about classifying stars. Now we're talking about, okay, how do stars actually live? How do they form? How do they, uh, do they change during their lives? How do they die? That kind of stuff there. So that's kind of going through that stuff. So just to start out with something that we've definitely talked about before, so you can remember this. What elements do most stars fuse in their cores? So we definitely talked about this well back at the beginning of the semester. We talked about nuclear fusion. Um, so see if you remember that and put in the answer. Okay, so, uh, the key to this is most stars, because it's actually not true, and again, we're going to get to this, uh, later that this is not what all stars do, but all main sequence stars, okay, so any star in this path going down here, in this core, it fuses hydrogen. Okay, that's just what it fuses. Um, and we've talked about this before, how stars fuse. Stars uh, are made, again, to, in the main sequence, they are hydrogen, and they start fusing hydrogen in their cores, and they fuse the hydrogen into helium. Remember the process of fusing two hydrogen into uh, one helium, or, no, four hydrogen to one helium, sorry. And doing that gives you energy, and through e equals mc squared, and all that kind of stuff. So that's how the stars get energy. So today, we're going to get into kind of how, uh, again, life cycle of stars. Starting off with, of course, how are stars, well, born? I guess it sounds weird to think of them as alive, but, I mean, you know. Uh, but this is the terminology that's used. So stars are born um, through a way that's kind of straightforward. Because think about, like, if you're out in space, right, there's no air resistance, right? There's no friction. I mean, I guess there could be technically from, from like, particles flying around, but basically no, right? So um, if you have just stuff that exists in space, well, gravity is a thing. It exists everywhere. So what happens is you end up with a cloud of dust and cloud of gas that's just sort of sitting there. And after a while, it'll start sort of, gravity will sort of cause it to sort of compress in among itself. So stars form from clouds of gas that collapse under their own gravity, okay? So, and then as, and if you've taken chemistry, if you talked about like the ideal gas law, that sort of comes into play here. So, as uh, the gas compresses, the pressure uh, inside increases. Okay, so the pressure of the gas increases as it sort of collapses in on itself. Now, if you remember again from chemistry, the ideal gas law, as you increase the pressure of a gas, what happens to it? Its temperature goes up. Okay. This is causing its temperature to increase. And this temperature increases to like million something degrees. Okay, it's, it's a lot. So, um... Eventually, the uh, temperature gets so hot 
uh, so that hydrogen fusion becomes possible. Okay, so at some point, the temperature gets hot enough for fusion to start occurring. Now, sometimes that doesn't actually happen, okay? If you have a really small amount of gas, it's not going to get that hot. And this is where you get something called a brown dwarf. So, um, let me kind of get this, uh, write that in. So, if you don't have enough gas to get to that temperature, you end up with just a ball of gas that's not fusing hydrogen. This is known as a brown dwarf. Okay, so it's the question is kind of is a brown dwarf a star, right? It's kind of a question of that because well, it's not fusing, but you may think, well, wait a minute, what about what's the difference between like this and like Jupiter, right? Jupiter's it's a ball of gas. Well, first of all, it orbits a star, so that's kind of you know why it's different there. But also, they just form differently because this is sort of a cloud of gas that's sort of just by itself that's um, collapsing, whereas Jupiter was formed also from a cloud of gas and dust and stuff, but it was stuff that was uh, formed after a star had already exploded and then a new star had formed in the middle of that, but then there were kind of extra pieces floating around. And so so it has to do more with formation differences than, uh, because again, if you, you could take Jupiter and you could take a brown dwarf star and you could sort of put them next to each other. And if you were to sort of observe them, there probably would not be that many differences between them. Maybe some, again, composition is one, because for example, we do think there are some heavier elements inside of Jupiter. Um, but again, we can talk about that more later. Um, whereas this is mostly just a ball of hydrogen. Um, so it is different, but this kind of keeps in mind. So for, also, if you remember, for example, there's the, the, uh, the image I showed you of, uh, the, the other HR diagram that had like, besides the other letters, it went up to L and T. That's sort of the brown dwarf range of uh, when talking about that. Um, they don't do fusion, but they still kind of glow sort of because again the the pressure in the inside is it's not enough to create hydrogen fusion but it's still really hot right so you have like the core glowing hot and that glow can kind of leak through because of that and so it's it it does technically glow but it's you know it's not exactly the same as like again an actual star um so yeah um that's what the brown dwarf is basically where you the gas does not get hot enough to start hydrogen fusion um, the more gas you have, the hotter, uh, the temperature will be, thus allowing larger stars to form. Okay. So you have more gas when it can, when it collapses, um, you end up getting, um, a hotter temperature in the middle. And that sort of that sort of determines how big and hot your star is. Um, and as you imagine, well, it's a lot easier to collapse smaller pieces of gas than larger pieces of gas. So hence why you have a lot more small stars than big stars. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how that forms in that sense. Uh, I feel like I was going to add something to this. Uh, oh, um, the let's see the uh, clouds of gas can also collapse in multiple areas forming multiple stars at once okay so this is if you've ever heard of for example like binary star systems this is when you have two stars that are sort of kind of right next to each other and they sort of like orbit each other and deal with stuff that's a similar thing here where you have a big cloud of gas but it collapses sort of in two different places um or more than that for example the nearest star to us besides the sun um is a trinary star system. It's three stars. It's um, Alpha Centauri A, you have Alpha Centauri B, and you have Proxima Centauri. Um, I think in this image, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this one here, this is Alpha Centauri. This is Alpha Centauri A. It's about, it's very similar to the sun. It's a little bit bigger um, in size, but it's like same temperature. Um, yeah, so that's very similar. Uh, Alpha Centauri B is not labeled on here. It's a K star. I'm not sure exactly so w where, but I, I think it's on the hotter end of the Ks. So it's around here, I think. So it's still pretty close to the sun. It is smaller, but it's, you know, still fairly similar. And then Proxima Centauri, that's all the way down here. It's a small M star. So those all three kind of collapse into each other. And you can see, then there's also other ones, like again, like Sirius. If you've heard of Sirius, uh, this is Sirius A, I think. This is like the main Sirius star. It's also Sirius B. There's like, 
Uh, or no, I'm thinking of Cygnus. Never mind. Cygnus is the one where there's um like seven stars, so that are all kind of right next to each other. So yeah, um, you can get some very complicated situations from this. Actually, I believe that we think that most, like half of all stars, uh, are have at least one other partner to them. Okay, so only about half of the stars are just kind of singular stars by themselves. So that's kind of an interesting thing you can get from that. Um, but yeah, so uh. How do we ask multiple stars at once? And how does this one work? Okay. Um, when a star forms, um, it is always on the main sequence. Okay. So once the star is actually formed, it is on the main sequence. Um, somewhere on here. And again, so smaller clumps of gas are going to form stars like Barnard's star or Proxima Centauri, where really big clouds of gas could form, you know, Regulus or Akronar or, uh, what does it say? Spica? Spica? I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, anyway, yeah. So you can get all these different kinds of stars forming in this way. Um, and they're all in the main sequence. So any star that's on, so any star that's on the main sequence, that is how it kind of formed that way. Well, okay, that's not that's not true. Um, uh, that said, over time, uh, stars do get a bit hotter and brighter over their uh, normal lifespan. Okay, so for example, the sun. When the sun formed, it was not this size. It was it was uh, cooler and it was dimmer. Um, I don't remember. I don't know how much exactly, but I believe actually, I believe it was something like when. The, I'm not sure if this was when it first formed or if this was like closer to like, you know, a billion or so years ago. The sun was like eighty percent of its brightness. It was it was a noticeable difference. Um, so, but again, this is something that takes, you know, a billion, a couple billion years for it to change some percent. So, um, this is a very slow, gradual process of it getting kind of hotter and just sort of doing its thing. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how that works there. Um, so, but stars spend the vast majority, nice little majority, of their lives on the main sequence. Okay, so even the stuff I'm talking about with this, with the sun like growing and getting hotter, it just moved on the main sequence, right? It was probably like you know down over here instead, and maybe and slowly transitioned up to here or something, right? So it was still on the main sequence, it just moved a bit on the main sequence. Um, yeah. Oh, so the lifespan of this though, and again, if you remember up here, I said that how the the O stars, you know, the ones at the very upper end of the di diagram, they uh have the shortest lifespan, while the M stars have the longest lifespan. So, um, for high mass stars, like O stars, uh, they live for, uh, about 10 million years. Okay. And that sounds like a lot, but it's not really, if you think about it, I mean, you know, you need six generations of O stars to get well, actually, more than six, more like uh, almost seven generations of O stars to get to when the dinosaurs went extinct, right? So we have like many modern, many modern species of animals that have like you know lived longer than O stars, right? So it's not that long. Um, see, so yeah, high mass stars live for ten, uh, ten million years, and while uh, for low mass stars like M stars they live for about they can live for um up to like 10 trillion years 10 or even 100 trillion years okay so this is sort of your really huge range of uh values here and again it's a range right so these might be 10 million then it kind of be 100 million maybe these are like a billion you get to here's the sun the sun oh, let me write this in uh the sun will in total spend about 10 billion years on the main sequence. Um, it is currently about 4.5 billion years old. Okay, 
So that's sort of our range of what we're looking for here. So these would be 10 billion. Maybe these stars here would get to like 100 billion and then trillion, 10 trillion, 100 trillion. I believe 100 trillion is like the very smallest stars that are still stars. Those might live to be 100 trillion years. Now, granted, the universe itself is only 13.7 billion years. So um, any star that's like, you know, smaller than this, basically, um, probably about here or so in the main sequence, um, they could have been living for, like, since near the beginning of the universe. I mean, stars could not form in the very beginning of the universe, but pretty quickly. I think in the first, like, million or so years of the universe, we started getting some stars. Granted, all the original stars were, like, enormous, huge, giant ones that, like, exploded really early, but whatever. Talk about that later. So, um, yeah, but just keep that in mind in terms of the scale here. So you get about get from about 10 million to about 10 trillion going all the way down, and the range of that in that sense there. And they just sort of, again, they change a bit on the main sequence. Most of them, I, th I think most of them, I don't think this is just what the sun did, uh, get a little bit hotter as they age, but not much. That hit ho that uh, increase of the sun, by the way, that will happen. Um, oh, it's continuing to happen. So, for example, in about, I think it was like 800 million years or a billion years or so in the future, um, even though the sun is still on the main sequence, it will have, again, moved more over here. And at that point, actually, it will get hot enough to the point where, like, the oceans will start to boil away. So, it's, yeah, um, and this is, no, this is nothing to do with climate change. Um, so if you ever hear people talk about, like, no, it's the sun, that's why it's first climate change, like, no. <laughs> Again, this is the span of billions of years. It's not going to affect anything in, you know, the hundred or so that we've had drastic temperature changes. Um, if anything, the sun actually does have sort of a, a cycle of activity that's going on that's about an 11-year cycle. Um, so first of all, it's an 11-year cycle, so if our temperature of the Earth was affected by that cycle, um, then it would be, you'd see, oh my god, all this happened in just these 11 years or some, something, right? And that's not what happened. Um, and then also, where we are right now is actually like a solar minimum. So if anything, like the cycle, of the, it's it, a cycle of activity where it's like the sun is more active than less active, more active than less active over an 11 year cycle. And so right now the sun is less active. So like, if anything, I think I remember reading that it's like weirdly lowly active <laughs> or something. So, um, yeah. So that, that, yeah, that talking point doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's how that all kind of comes into play with that. Okay, so then the question is, well, what happens when you sort of reach the end of that? Well, remember um, that all this comes from uh, the sun burning hydrogen, right? So, uh, so stars sustain sustain what sustain themselves by fusing hydrogen into helium. Well, well, we'll do that which creates energy that balances out the inward push of gravity, okay? So the sun is, all stars are constantly being pushed inward by gravity, but since they're producing energy through fusion, they're pushing back against that. And again, if you're a hotter star, you are, um, you have more energy to burn, you're pushing out more energy, which means you can afford to be bigger and still counteract the gravity of yourself. Um, so that's what's going on. Uh, however, only the inner 10% uh, or so of the star is hot enough uh, to fuse hydrogen. Okay, and then again, this also varies depending on the stars. Again, the biggest stars probably be more like maybe 20% of the, of the inside is hot enough to fuse hydrogen, but it's not, it's not like the, the entire star is not fusing hydrogen. It's just kind of a smaller portion in the middle. Um, so, um, and, and this hydrogen will eventually uh, all be converted into helium, okay? They'll all be converted into helium. Now, again, for the biggest stars, because they're so much hotter, they burn through, even though they have more of it because they're bigger, they, it's because it's hotter, they burn through it quicker. So this is the whole thing about, oh, stars living for about 10 million years. They burn through their hydrogen really quickly. Whereas, well, again, comparatively, M stars, they're a lot smaller. So it takes a long time for them to burn through their hydrogen. It's again, 10 trillion years worth of time. So 
Um, that takes a long time until they get the helium. But eventually, once you get it all to helium, well, then what? Then you're kind of stuck, right? And so at this point, um, so once the star reaches this stage, um, they, they're not producing uh, the energy needed to counteract gravity. So the core starts shrinking, or starts, I'll say collapsing. Because again, gravity is now like, oh, hey, you're not pushing back against me. I can compress the core. So it compresses the core first, because that's, you know, in the middle. Um, now, kind of a weird uh, side effect of this is that um, the outside layers of the star actually begin expanding. And it has to do, again, with if you compress the core more, then it gets hotter, which then, even though it's not like nuclear fusion energy, it's still producing some energy that therefore pushes against the outer parts of the star. So... Um, which causes the outer layers of the star to expand. Okay, um, and this continues for a while. It takes a, it takes a, a uh, it's not an instantaneous process, but um, it takes a bit. Of, it it takes a bit of time. It's not like a, it's not like billions of years though. Um, and the star again, the core shrinks. The core gets hotter, but the outside part of it grows and it gets bigger and it gets cooler. Um. To expand and cool. Um, this uh, uh, causes stars to become giants that have cooler surface temperatures than originally. Okay, so for example, you, there, what are the giants? Well, you have this block of stars right here, and again, there's some others over here whatever so when you have for example the sun it will start ballooning in size it'll grow to be sort of cooler but bigger it'll grow into a giant i'm not sure how big exactly it will get i'm sure it won't get to the biggest ones because again the, these biggest stars are off are going to be caused by like these stars growing to be over there um and you get to this really this spot here now what happens and this is by the way this is the whole thing about where you go oh the sun will swallow the earth this is what they're talking about okay so they're talking about how the radius of this of the sun as it expands into a red giant it could be big enough to the point where it is outside it, it uh, encompasses earth's orbit um we're not 100 percent sure about this but like the models seem to because the models are not perfect but like and so but even then oh it doesn't swallow the earth okay but it could be like right there earth's definitely not gonna be habitable at all um even if it's technically not gone at this point so yeah now what happens though that's kind of interesting um is that um, uh, eventually the star's core will get hot enough to start fusing helium, okay? So it's then, so again, the outside's been expanding, getting hotter, or no, getting cooler, but the inside's been being compressed and getting hotter. Um, and eventually it gets hot enough to start fusing helium. Um, now when this happens... It actually sort of like it, it's this kind of burst of energy all of a sudden right because you all of a sudden oh whoa now i'm suddenly fusing helium so once that happened this star sort of like rebounds a bit it actually sort of kind of contracts a bit it gets a little bit hotter um on the outside of it uh, as a whole so it doesn't balloon up as much it comes back a little bit it doesn't get all the way it doesn't get all the way back to how it was originally but it does sort of shrink a little bit and it does get a little bit hotter so for example it might not be like a star that's all the way this size it might kind of become a star that's like this size right so it's a little bit smaller a little bit yellower um that's sometimes called the helium flash or like the or something like that so i've seen that kind of talked about a bit um so that's something that happens um and you get to a star that uh hebel uh, what did i just say start fusing helium i'm starting to say stable and then i said he helium at the same time um so the star is now in a new stable state where it fuses helium helium the core is hotter um, than originally, while the surface is cooler, and the star itself is noticeably bigger. Okay, not quite as big as the whole red giant expansion right before that, but it's still like really, really big. Okay, so um, we're not talking. About, oh, it's maybe like twice the size. No, it's still like maybe 100 times the size so it yeah it's very big um and it and it continues doing this now it can now it, it just like how before it was fusing hydrogen now it's fusing helium um 
So this helium fusion continues until the helium runs out, just like the hydrogen before it. Now this process again, it, it's it's it takes a lot less time. Um, so while uh, the again the sun, for example, on the main sequence uh, is going to live about ten billion years. When it's fusing helium, I think it's only like a hundred million years or something, or something like, or maybe ten million years. It's a lot less um, of time that this will happen. So, uh, though it takes noticeably less time, okay, for this to occur, uh, the star will then expand. Or no, this the star, the star's core will then start to collapse again while the outside expands like before. Okay, uh, for stars like our sun or lower mass stars, so again, think like K or M stars. M stars actually might not even get the helium process to work, um, but the sun, the sun will get the helium process to work, but um, after this, for other lower mass stars, um, the core never gets hot enough to fuse any heavier elements. So what happens then is that, uh, the outside layer, uh, of these stars, uh, expands and I always like to describe it as poofing away. So it, it poofs away, uh, from the star to form a planetary nebula okay and it's not a great description of this because it's nothing really to do with the planets themselves um originally this was thought to kind of lead to planet formation which is actually not really true so it's just it's sort of a name that's just what we've been using for hundreds of years that's not actually really accurate anymore um but it, it's a planetary nebula it basically when you think of a, ne a nebula is again this sort of cloud of gas now from this you could actually form other stars um although as you may imagine, you're not going to form a bigger star out of the remains of a smaller one, right? That's not going to happen. So you could have a smaller star kind of form in its place from that, um, but this is sort of an idea of how this works. So it poofs away to sort of form a planetary nebula. Um, the core continues collapsing um, until you end up with a white dwarf. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you what a white dwarf is. That'll be uh later that'll be uh i think tomorrow or is it monday i don't know whatever uh, i have to check what, it, what it's going to be um but it's uh so a white dwarf is sort of what's remaining so you end up with so if we're wondering what about all these stars that are down here well that's what that is okay so once the stars sort of reach the end of its stuff the outer layers are all poof away and the core will end up collapsing into one of these tiny stars here and again we'll talk about more about what these are later so don't worry too much about those right now um, but this is the lower mass stars. What about the higher mass stars? Okay. Uh, higher mass stars like O or B stars uh, have cores that do get hot enough uh, to fuse the next step, which is to carbon. Um, and this cycle repeats, okay? So how, for example, I said like, oh, you have a star down here and it expands to fuse helium. When it fuses helium, it does kind of kind of rebound back to be a little bit bigger. Then it will expand again. And, you know, but then eventually it'll sort of collapse and the white dwarf will form. These stars over here, they might, oh, expand to fuse helium and then they kind of come around and then expand to fuse carbon and then rebound back and then expand to fuse oxygen and go back and expand to fuse uh, neon, I think it's Mexico. Right, so it gets this sort of zigzag pattern where it sort of goes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and... It, depending on where you are, for example, like maybe, I don't know, again, like Sirius or Vega or whatever, maybe they can do helium, carbon, and oxygen, and that's as far as they can go. But maybe these over here can go helium, carbon, oxygen, neon, mm, silicon, no, I think it's magnesium, and then silicon, and then iron. I don't, I don't remember the order. Anyway, um, so however many steps you can go, but eventually, and uh, you can see how far they go, use carbon. Uh, and the process repeats until uh, the star reaches an element that 
it cannot fuse because it never gets hot enough. Okay, and so that's you can get uh, bigger stars and stuff like that going on. Um, you know, probably okay. You can choose the B or A stars. Okay, so that's kind of how this works there. However, the very hottest and biggest stars, like O stars, um, can uh, have cores that get so hot they can fuse all the way to iron. Now, if you remember, what is special about trying to fuse iron? Okay, remember the process for the whole point of this is that when you fuse these lighter elements, you're producing energy, right? Fusing hydrogen to helium produces energy. Fusing helium to carbon produces energy. Fusing carbon to oxygen produces energy. When you fuse iron, you lose energy, okay? So when this happens, the star is now not producing energy anymore. Um, so gravity completely takes over and, uh, collapses the core, uh, violently. So as before, again, this whole thing about the core collapse and expanding, that was not a violent process. It was a slow kind of steady process that took a while. This is like a, it's an immediate, just crash inward. I mean, I guess not immediate, immediate, but very, very quickly, um, core violently causing the rest of the star to explode outward um, in a supernova. Okay, so this is a supernova. Um, what we talked about before about this whole thing um, with the planetary nebula, that's not a supernova. Okay, so the sun will not go supernova. That's not how that's going to work. So this is this whole before was sort of a, a gradual gentler process that's not as that's not violent. This is a violent just freaking huge explosion. Okay, um, so it explodes outwards in a supernova. Uh, the core is left as a neutron star. Okay, and again, we'll get into kind of what that is a bit later as well. Um, so this is sort of your violent explosion where you... So going back to uh, this here, some of the stars like way up here, you like, oh, I'm fusing hydrogen, everything's great. And then, oh, I'm going to grow up, and now I'm fusing helium. Oh, now I'm fusing carbon. Oh, now oxygen. Now neon. Now magnesium. Now silicon. Now iron. Oh, crap. Right, and then you they just explode, and then you end up with neutron stars. These would be stars that are like all the way down in like this very corner they're they're like neutron stars can get to like several hundred thousand degrees and they're super super tiny so they're like all the way in this corner but anyway so yeah that's sort of the process for how this works there so your low mass star again all stars form in the same kind of way the low mass stars and they're all fusing hydrogen to start with then they end up growing and then kind of fusing helium and again i'm not some of the smallest ones down here they might actually not get to helium they might just once they're done with the hydrogen they might eventually just sort of poof out as planetary nebula immediately but again that this takes trillions of years for these ones down here um whereas again so they'll stars will they'll try to fuse helium and then if they can do helium they'll try to fuse carbon if they can do carbon they can try to fuse oxygen yeah i don't remember the order um you can look it up um but yeah once they get to iron um then again some stars a lot most stars never get to iron they just never get hot to do it but even the the biggest ones once they do get to iron then they sort of just lose it and they're like oh crap and they just like they just freaking blow so yeah that's a, a supernova is defined as an explosion of a star that results in a neutron star okay so that's actually sort of your definition of a supernova in that sense that's kind of the whole life cycle of stars and then from that you end up with so the white dwarfs and the neutron stars um are sort of your stellar remnants sort of they're the dead stars okay um and sort of how they work with that and we'll talk more about those later so um yeah. Uh, oh, and here's a diagram that I have that sort of shows off the uh, the the sections of the HR diagram a bit better. So again, here's your main sequence, right? Your main sequence stars, your your V stars, all kind of along here. Again, you have your. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why there's these there, the lines are curved, but I think what this is meaning is that anything between these two sections here is a B star. Anything between these two sections is an A star. These is an F star. These are G stars, K, and these are M. I don't know why it's kind of curved like that though, but whatever. Um, so, um, you, again, you can see here's most of them are on the main sequence, but of course you do have this sort of group of giants, right? So this is your, you know, 
your FGK stars that end up trying to fuse helium are going to be up in here. But then when you get up to these stars up here, these are when they're fusing past helium and they're fusing like, you know, carbon, oxygen, neon, whatever. Um, and you can see how that works. Um, again, though, I'm not really sure exactly the difference between the 1A and the 1B, so don't worry about that. Um, and you might wonder, well, what's the what about the, the subgiants? How do those work? I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not sure exactly how you get to that. So... Yeah, and of course there's a white torch down there, so this kind of shows that. And then also here's an image that sort of shows um, exactly how, what path the star will, the sun will take. Okay, so here's the main sequence right now, right? The main sequence of how this works, you get the sort of shape of the sun. So the sun is here in the main sequence, and so it'll burn hydrogen in its core, and that'll happen for a span. And this is about nine billion, but it should take about you know ten billion years. Um, and then it's going to start growing into being a red giant star, right? Because it's done with it's done fusing hydrogen in its core, it starts growing. Well, again, the outside starts growing. It ends up growing bigger and it's being a red giant burning hydrogen. Yeah, so you actually do get sort of a shell of hydrogen that burns sort of around the core, but it's really not very much. And so again, this, is, this says this process will take about um, a billion years to sort of have the sun sort of grow into this size. Um, but then once it gets to this size, then it will see helium in the core ignites. This is your helium flash. This kind of is the star kind of condensing in on itself a bit. And then it sort of burns as a yellow giant. It's sort of burning with your... Uh, helium and so you can see here also while it's burning the helium it's only living for about 100 million years whereas you know the star burning hydrogen is about 10 billion and then it'll once this happens it'll sort of expand out and then it will try to see it will it tries to get hot enough to fuse carbon as your red supergiant but it just it just doesn't happen it, it just it doesn't get hot enough and then the outer layers sort of poof off as your planetary nebula and then the core shrinks and collapses and it ends up collapsing into being a white dwarf that's somewhere all the way down here so yeah, um, that's sort of the process of how this works. And you, can, you can see sort of a time span, right? So the planetary nebula lasts a few thousand years, and then the white dwarf just sort of sits there. The white dwarfs, white dwarfs last for stupidly long periods of time. So, but again, we'll get into that more later. Um, I believe. Well, let's see. I believe. No, I'll talk about this. So, white dwarfs, they 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 do have kind of a residual heat to them. Um, so they do glow, and they they glow, but they do very very slowly fade. And by very slowly, I mean over trillions of years. So, for example, and eventually they will become basically, we call it black dwarfs, right? They're white dwarfs that have just, they are, just don't glow anymore. They're they're too cold, but this is trillions of years long. So, first of all, how would we even see them? They're literally just black things just floating in space, which is kind of black. But based on timelines of how we think things work, there should be no black dwarfs in the universe. The universe is not old enough to have black dwarfs. So, um that's sort of how that works from there and this gives you some, some timeline here and again you can look at uh i believe also something like with this with this span here of, of how oh the hydrogen fusion is 10 billion years but the helium fusion is like 100 million years i think if you were to keep going there's a way of estimating it and for like the hottest stars with like again oxygen fusion is less time than this and he, he, neon is less than that the final step of silicon fusion i think i've read somewhere that that we think that can only last like a few days so yeah, um, this for the end of a star's lifespan where it's sort of it gets all really crazy for a giant one before it goes kablooey. So uh, yeah, you can get stuff that's uh, pretty crazy in that sense. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of showing about this. Uh, there is another video which someone else made that all that is uh, linked in the classroom post that kind of goes over this uh, quite well. So. If you want kind of a bit more of uh, more information about it, then you can kind of see that video. Maybe that explanation is a little bit better for you. Um, but I think this sort of uh, pathfinding for that works out way, well and interestingly and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, okay, I think now we're on to the wrap-up question. Get to it. Is that gonna... Yeah, okay. So, uh, if we have an M53 star, uh, what element would it most likely be fusing? Okay, so M53, let's sort of place where this is on the diagram. So, again, 3, that's your giant space. So, M5, that's sort of be in the middle of the M, so kind of, you know, over here on the giant space. So, that would be on this diagram about, you know, these, a couple of these stars. Like, so what element would this star here probably be fusing? And on the main sequence, it's going to be fusing hydrogen. But if it's over here, what is it probably going to be fusing? So giants, these giant stars are fusing helium. 
Okay, the giant star is refusing helium. Once you get to the super, the super hyper giants, whatever, then it's probably the other elements, but giants, they're fusing helium. So yeah, anything in this sort of section here is gonna be fusing helium. So answer is helium. So your homework, you actually have a bit of homework now, um, is I'm basically splitting you up in half um, where I want half of you to sort of write about uh, kind of your own, in your own words describing the life cycle of uh, a low mass star. So again, think like M star, K star, a G star. Um, and the other half of you are describing a life cycle of, an, of a high mass star, an o, o star, B star, A star, uh, seeing how that works there. Um, if you want, you can also look at more information in terms of specific numbers, like again, in terms of life cycle. For example, how long does an O star last fusing oxygen, right? I don't know the number. Um, you could look that up and we have some ideas about that. So um, yeah, put this in your own words. Don't just like copy what I've written here. Um, and you know, it doesn't need to be some grand essay or anything, but at least have it be, you know, an actual paragraph. Um, I've split it up. The, the last name I've split up this way is so that it's probably roughly equal amount of people will be writing, you know, each thing. There's more of you that have a last name at the beginning half of the alphabet, so there you go. Um, but yeah, so again, pretty straightforward homework. You can see this works there. So yeah, I guess that's it for now. Um, again, if you want a bit more info on this or another uh, kind of run through on this, uh, there's the other video that someone else made that I have linked here below that you can watch and uh, that's useful information as well. So. Yeah, okay, uh, I'm done.